Hello, everyone, and welcome to another uh, recording of the Three Black Pride Grads. My name is Kenneth Nelson. I'm here with my good friends, Greg Claghorn. <laughs> I forgot and, my name already. Huh? Thanks, and Mark man. Skinner. <laughs> All uh, photography graduates of the Fine Heart Photography Program at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, USA. And uh, we get together once or tw twice a week uh, to discuss uh, our thoughts and our feelings about uh, photography, all aspects of it. Uh, we've all been involved with photography for at least 30 years, if not more. So uh, tonight's episode, tonight's, yeah, tonight's conversation uh, I brought, was my idea. And today we're going to be discussing art photography movements uh, in history that have guided us in our own uh, photographic vision. Uh, art photography movements, all, also known as a coalition of photographers, uh, practicing or focused on a particular perspective within photography. Uh, I'm not going to go into each photographic movement. Uh, I'll just reference them, <laughs> major ones that I'm aware of. And uh, guys, you can reference the major ones you're aware of too. And if you need more information about uh, those movements, um, just Google the ones that we'll reference today. So I'll just go down and start the list off of movements that I know about. And then we can get into the first presentation, which will be marked. So uh, the list consists of pictorialism, uh, straight photography, abstract photography, futurism, constructivism, surrealism, fashion photography, photojournalism, documentary, street photography, and postmodern photography. Those are the ones that I'm aware of, that I became aware of. <laughs> so with that... I'm going to give it over to Mark so he can give us his thoughts and ideas about um, the movement that most affected him or an individual photographer throughout history that has guided him in the way he shoots now. Look happier, Mark. You look so oh, sullen, man. No, no. I had, I had to, well, thanks to Ken's introduction, I had to think about like how I was going to say what I want to say. Um, yeah, listen to every other that, word. Kenny is. That's really man. funny. I had no idea Ken was. You know, initially, when you, when, you, when you gave us this topic and said, okay, this is what it's going to be, you know, I thought about two photographs that were influenced by two different photo photographers. And then one I definitively wanted to use, but one was a photograph we'd used before. So I said, well, let me, you know, try to fine tune this a little bit. Uh, and so these two photographs that, that I have this evening, I'll do this very quickly. Uh, you can throw one up on the screen there. One up, there you go. There, there you go. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that is a photograph of Trinity Place downtown Manhattan. And uh, we're looking, uh, I guess, what is it? East toward uh, Broadway. Broadway. Yep, mm -hmm. Broadway. And what the the photographer uh, that really uh, influenced this photograph? I took I did this a couple of days ago. Would be Eugene Ache. Now you guys know about Eugene Ache because, well, you went to Pratt. And that's like one of the first photographers they show you, and you know, A T G E T A J. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You know, you know, we talk about Boca. Uh, one of the previous episodes, and there's like a photograph of a of a guy walking with a uh, pulling a a cart. You know, he's a mer merchant with a cart, and and then and he's all in focus, and then the, the the background's out of focus, and that's pretty much what all of that Boca stuff is about. But in this picture, what Ache used to do is he used to photograph all these uh, old Paris is what he used to photograph, and yeah. he's very proud of the fact that he had uh, had had documented all of old Paris and, and you know and, and and he had given a lot of them to the to the they sold a lot of them to the to the French government and uh when he'd passed away more of them were given to the French government and the other set were sold to an American photographer in Paris named um Bernice Abbott now I think you know a couple of days ago was International Women's Day and I think that uh uh, I don't think I've mentioned any uh, women photographers in this uh, talk, these talks that we've had, but I felt that, you know, Bernice Abbott, having purchased Ache's, yeah. uh, you know, a library, what part of her is library, and really because of her, we know Ache because he really, a lot of his work wasn't famous until she bought it and then made 
uh, made it famous um, after his passing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they were good friends while they were alive, and she kind of discovered him, <laughs> you know, in a weird way because he was old and didn't have anything going on uh, by the time they met. And if you go to the next photo... It's like, go to the light, Carolyn. Wait, but why did you pick this picture? What, what was it uh, about no, this? this one, I'm sorry. Thanks, Greg. I, yeah. think, I think, you know, I picked this photo because Acha used to photograph his old Paris was very much like all these old streets. A number of them wound, you know, from left to right. But a lot of them were just down the street. You could see the walls of the buildings as they lined the streets. And quite often there was something sort of at the end, there was sort of a reward. It wasn't just a, a street that goes to nowhere. Like here in the United States, sometimes the avenues and boulevards are so long that the streets don't have endings. You know, they, you know, we see a, a street scene and it goes to almost it's infinity. Concrete canyons, those yeah. concrete canyons. Yeah. Exactly, and ironically, the street that we see at the end of this photo on the right side Broadway is just one of those types of boulevards that, you know, if you if you look at until it turns miles from where you're standing, mm -hmm. you know, it, you just it just goes on forever. So I liked this photo a lot when I took it, uh, like I said, just a couple of days ago, because I realized that even to this day, some thirty some odd years after graduating, I'm still very much influenced. My tastes are very much influenced by Ache, and I think even when I photograph fashion, there's a, a little bit of the, in the in the field, when I'm not doing uh, the types of headshots that kind of people need, but when I get more atmosphere, I, I kind of resort to that sort of Ache-esque uh, uh, sensibility of canyons. and, and uh, it, it looks like something out of a M. Night Shyamalan movie, man. It's like someplace you would want to be after dark. But I do like that red awning just, you know, on the other side uh, that, that that gives me hope. <laughs> if yeah, I could right. just make it to that awning. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, this is, from my perspective, this particular image is very much channeling Eugene Ajay. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, very much so. And, and as soon as I saw it, I went, oh, wow, it's just like Eugene Ajay. Let me just take yeah. it. And so, because, so why did you choose not to put any people in it? What, what, why make it so barren? Well, number one, this was a few days ago, and uh, and there weren't any people. Because that street is and, virtually never empty. Is that a COVID and, empty? Yeah, it might be COVID. No, it's, no, it's it's this is not due to COVID. I mean, this is empty. <laughs> this is an alleyway, Greg. Yeah. It's not okay. a major street. No, well, I've right. been down in Lower Manhattan. There's always somebody in Lower Manhattan. Believe it or not, after I took the photo, I did like a Google search of that area, and, it, and he's absolutely right. There were there was like one person sitting on a hydrant at the corner, <laughs> looking at their cell phone. Two other people were looking or looking around like they couldn't find the Freedom Tower because the, you know, <laughs> there, there were yet another canyon. And if you look up, the building that's right in front of, right right behind me where I'm standing, the buildings that are there are just tall enough where. The, the the Freedom Tower is and the Oculus are just on the other side of that block, but you can't but see you can't them. see it. Right. Yeah. So if you okay. don't know where you are, you you're 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 scratching your head trying to figure out where where am right. I in relation to that. Okay. Um, so if you go to the next photo. Yeah. Bernice Allen, and every, you know, everybody who is in that area of uh, down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass, Dumbo, it's probably the most famous scene of that. Everyone who's down there at least takes that, that photograph of the uh, Manhattan Bridge. Yep. And now that street is never empty day no, and night. It's never, but, but if you notice, I've, I've looked up, I've cut it into a panoramic, right? It's a panoramic uh, photograph. Actually, that was how it was photographed almost. Eh, no, nah, I got it. It's, um, <laughs> it was, yeah, long story short. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, uh, I cut it into a panoramic and, uh, I made a point to remove all the people who were down below. And, uh, this photo is very much like Bernice Abbott because she used to take a lot of photographs of the then changing. Uh, uh, Manhattan, and uh, when she was kind of becoming famous in the late 30s and the early 40s, she was taking a lot of photographs, not quite as much straight photography as Ache, 
and she was starting to go away from that. But she does have a lot of straight photographs that are images of the Manhattan Bridge at a distance, sometimes from Henry Street, sometimes from um, you know other 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 points of view. Mm. And uh, you know, I just felt that uh, this is such a popular view of the bridge that. I felt obligated to tell everyone that, yeah, we really kind of get this idea of how to view the, the bridge from Bernice Abbott. And then later on in the the poster for uh, Once Upon a Time in America, that really kind of brought it to the masses, you know. So it's the same street. You go to that spot and you photograph with almost any camera the bridge, you'll see that it looks just like the poster for Once Upon a Time in America. Unless you crop it as I have. It's striking. I mean, it's just you, you're walking along down there and then boom, this bridge jumps out, you know. And the uh, the uh, Empire State Building is right underneath the bottom arch. It's a cool, very cool shot. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Thank you. But I mean, like I said, it's, it's, it, if you go there, it's there. So I don't think that that one is particularly special for me at this time. But I will say this, it's a good photograph, popular style photograph. And I think at the end of the day, we really do have Bernice Abbott to, to thank for showing us this beautiful view of the, uh, uh, of the, yeah. of the bridge. Yeah. And uh, I'll just add to say, that I think uh, I've been going through a couple of, thought processes over the past couple of weeks and coming to a conclusion that no matter how much we want to avoid cliche images, we are gravitated toward them immensely in our daily lives because they ground us in a certain sensibility that unites us all with the same vision, even though some of us curse having the same vision. But the yeah. fact is it all coalesces around this. Right. Hence the amount of people that want to photograph this same shot. Right, it becomes thing. part of the visual language that yeah. we share. Yep, I agree. Yeah, you know, it's just like crazy. But that should be like throwing down the gauntlet. You know, it's like, well, if I've, if I've uh, you know, gotten all this education, you know, how can I, or just as a creative, you know, creatives are challenged, how can I make this look different than everybody else's? You know, that's that's the, because it's a standard shot, you know, anybody right. can get it, you know. Go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry, Mark. What were you saying? No, I, I agree with you 100%. I think the photograph of the alley is probably a little bit more specific to what – what it's more specific in terms of that would be my photograph as opposed to this one. It is so common that, um, quite honestly, you know, and we talked about this offline at some point, you know, how do you bring uh, a sensibility – to right your own vision subject. right and for this you know i took a photograph you know i took photographs with this also as a panoramic and then i found one of the full sensor photographs that i just wound up cropping to a panoramic and you know you like you know you're looking and you're going ah, and it, you go, it looks just like a whole bunch of other stuff and you know but i you know i use this one for uh a cover for my facebook page but I also use this for this discussion, but it has immediate recognition, as Ken was mentioning. You know, you look and you go, wow, this is, you know, I get it. Manhattan yeah. Bridge, downtown Brooklyn, you know. Oh, I've been there. That's what you'll hear people say. Oh, I've been there. Yeah. That'll be the first thing that people will say. I've mm. seen, oh, I have my picture of it. You want to see? <laughs> right. And in that so this way, one, as much as this one is familiar, the other one is unfamiliar and it has a lot more character and more right. i mean this one that one says new york but this one says you know it's got some tension in it in the absence of people and the darkness on one side or both sides and then that one light streak up the side on the curb and then the color in the background you know, that that white brightness and that one you know splash of red you know it, it's it's uh, it's almost re uh, repeated in that little bit of red on the dark wall Right, but it's ominous. It has a texture almost to it that says, you know, what's going on here, and I feel a little uncomfortable looking at it. I want to get out of that alley right. and get into right. the but, sunlight. But then there's yeah. the, but then there's the question then of, you know, 
is a photograph, you know, really, and I, we touched on it before, you know, the idea that exclusivity in the uh, ability to acquire a specific image at a specific time. Mm -hmm. You know, this photograph can be replicated, but it's not going to be as easy to replicate uh, as that other one, because quite yeah. honestly, it's on the ground. There are different people, different characteristics of the light from the sun but all that goes into that you know and yeah. and whatever what if you know if any post-processing is done that's the, you know basically the full frame it's the same you know crop a smidgen but not a lot and you know it's one of those things where you look and you go you know how much of this is an original photograph an original idea when the other one is very obviously a very common place and it's an original photograph but at a certain point i almost felt silly taking it because there were so many people even while i was there with a tripod and a camera there are people with cell phones just looking up and taking pictures yeah. probably got very much the same thing and walked away yeah yeah it's a new york snapshot basically yeah. right yeah. but i think mark hinted on it in both both images which is although this is a it's it's your quintessential uh, tourist spot photograph and the the general nature of the image is pretty much universal the type of lighting that you uh, aspire to within the image is a differentiating factor uh, whether it's a clear day a cloudy day whether it's the sun is in the afternoon the sun is in the morning in this particular instance, I think, Mark, it looks like the sun is in the late afternoon. It's afternoon. Yeah. Right? So, right. So other people, and of course, depending on what time of year it is, the sun will either be higher or lower. And that they all affect the way the image looks. So the question is, yes, you can have a certain level of individuality within this quintessential tourist photograph. Can that be the differentiating factor that makes anything stand out? Yes, because... There are some standouts of this image that actually, uh, you know, hit the market and sell. Yeah, I mean, because they resonate for people. Yeah, they resonate for people. Yeah. And, you know, in some cases. And, and, you're bad, you're and why color instead of black and white? Well, you know, for me. I mean, I, if you're going to crop it, you know, and well, take it out of. You know, take it. You made it at uh, uh, at least in in the newspaper business. They call it like an evergreen image. You don't see, you know, certain model cars. You don't see certain dress that would date it, date stamp it. You know, you made it timeless, a timeless image. So why I, not? Why not black and white instead of color? I think if I made this one black and white, I think I would be getting much closer to previous photographs of this than I am now. And quite honestly, the clouds, not the clouds, the lack of clouds are, are kind of helping me, you know, uh, differentiate this photo from a lot of others, you know. Okay. If, uh, you know, if I, if I made it a black and white photograph, uh, I don't think, I don't think it would be as interesting to people. I think people really appreciate the, the warm sunset coloring of the, of the, Bridge. Mm. I would agree. Yeah, I'd like to see a print of this because the it it is like a a repetition of that um, reddish reddish brown color. Even in the walls, you know, yeah. or the buildings on the left and right, there's a reddish that reddish brown brick. You know, turn of the century. You know, those those monstrous solid buildings. Oh, those, those factories. Yeah, they're factories. I think they're apartments now. Yeah. They used to be factories. I remember when they were just abandoned factories. And we used to, I used to photograph uh, models, composites, and so forth down there. And there would be no one there in yep. the middle of the week. Now it's just, you know, mm. packed. It's insane. Even in the winter. Brooklyn had the best views, man. Yeah. Brooklyn had the best views. Right. Now, the other photograph, I did print a black and white photograph of that. And uh, because it's almost monochromatic, with the exception of that red uh, awning back there, mm -hmm. uh, it really it really holds up as a black and white photograph very easily. You just don't get the reward of the uh, the red awning um, in that 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 right side of the frame. Yeah. Yeah. This this is like it's so lyrical, you know. It's it's almost like you could write a short story just about this one image, you know. 
because because of that red, you know, because of the, you know, there's a lot going on. It's a simple photograph, but for me, there's a lot going on in it. I like this image. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, Greg, uh, let's go to you for now, okay? Let's yes, sir. Need to move let's on. Uh, move and... right along. All right. My I just want to say one last, thing, one last thing. So it was about my movement was straight photography, particularly the photography of Eugene Abbott and Bernice yeah. Abbott, who's actually much better than just what I have shown here. And it was really, if you don't know Bernice Abbott, you should check her out. And if it weren't for her, we would not know about Eugene Ache today. Go. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I guess first, thank you, Mark. That was uh, thank you for sharing those photographs. Thanks for you know inspiring that thoughtful conversation. That was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well. Well. I, okay. I mean, I got to go into some background. You know, I have I have like an art, uh, RT, a bunch of RT people in my family, and uh, my father was very very much into you know getting us out and uh, exploring and. Uh, experiencing things. I remember, I don't know if you guys, do you guys remember the Donnell Library? I think it was like 53rd near where MoMA yep. is now, yep. I think. Still yeah, there. We'd, he'd, he'd take us there and we'd listen to record. You know, that was like a big thing. You know, you get there on the headphones and talk about COVID scary. <laughs> you had to wipe them down. I don't even remember wiping them down. But just, you know, going able to, being able to pick a record, put it on the, the platter, you know, get some time and you'd sit there and just listen to music. That was, that was pretty cool. But uh, the other things, you know, you take us to the museums, you know, uh, the big boys on Fifth Avenue and, you know, it, across the park. Um, but, uh, you know, my brother was an illustrator and I always, you know, color was always around me, you know, and then, you know, we sang in the choir. So, you know, color and music and, you know, and um, when I got into art school, you know, it was like, you know, you know. So uh, one of my favorite artists, because she was just kind of offbeat, was, uh, you can put the first one up, is uh, Georgia O'Keeffe. You know, she's uh, in the Southwest. You know, this isn't, uh, this is, I did a series of these. You know, she did watercolor, and I, I kind of tweaked this a little bit to make it pale, and I popped a little light in there to get that, uh, the, um, the business end of the flower to come forward. And um, uh, I did a number of them. This one isn't all that close, but I did bring, go in close like she would do so that the whole frame is filled with this uh, watercolor colors everywhere, you know, and then the fine details of the, of the flower, the intricacies of the, you know, the stamen and all of that other stuff is uh, always intrigued me so that you're like, just, you know, just this, so not a smorgasbord, but just you're just surrounded in color, you know, and uh, it became like music, you know, you're, you're surrounded by this color and it's like all these sounds for the eyes, if that makes anything, you know, um, you know, explain the sound of one hand clapping, you know, that kind of a, a Zen moment for me. <laughs> and uh, um, I just uh, appreciated all of her watercolors. They always, they always made me think of how to capture something differently, you know, and how to make the ordinary extraordinary. And uh, I've always tried to find that in my photography or when, when, I, when I'm going out in the day, you know, um, sure, there's common ordinary things uh, that you pass by every day, but how can you capture it to make it different or extraordinary? And, Plants are just, you know, by themselves are amazing in the their uh, color and variety and uh, their scents and, uh, you know, um, hummingbirds that, that visit and bees that visit. You know, it's it's a it's a the symphony of nature, and I, I enjoy I enjoy Georgia O'Keeffe's work and uh, her whole movement in the Southwest of uh, you know watercolors and. Uh, sort of making, you know, the impermanent permanent, you know, by capturing it and putting it on canvas, you know, um, they, you know, flowers are very transitory. It's very much like life. You know, they're, they are young, they bloom, they flower, they reach their maturity and then they, then they go away, you know, and you get to enjoy them for a short period of time. But thanks to, you know, being able to, you know, these creative people, and having a creative medium like a, you know, uh, painting, drawing, or photography, 
you can capture that and make it last much longer. And uh, that's what I, yeah, that's one of the things that I enjoy doing. So the uh, movement or watercolor, uh, I'm not exactly what, what movement you would call this, but uh, she's definitely one of the, um, one of the influential artists in my, in my life, in my vision. Because, uh, you know, it doesn't always uh, happen all the time that you can capture something like this. But uh, she's always in the back of my mind. When I see something like this, like, oh, it's in Georgia. Let me, let me see if I can capture something like that. And I'll go in close. You know, you don't always have to do um, macro photography, even though it does help to have a macro lens in your toolkit. Um, there, there are ways to uh, make that happen, you know. Try different things, lenses, micro, magnifying glasses. You'd be surprised what you can do if you uh, put your imagination to it. Um, that's about all I have with this one. Do you guys have any input or? No, I don't. No? Okay. Mark, he's, he, I don't see him up there, but okay. It's, did we lose him? Okay, there you go. No, I'm still um, here. If you have no, no comments, I'm just going to move along. So let me uh, just want to ask you a question. Do you, you said you think about uh, O'Keefe while you're doing these photographs. Do you ever find yourself, you know, kind of setting out to like make a, 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 a photograph that's specifically looking like O'Keefe or do you just sort of see the image first and then you kind of go, oh, okay. And then you kind of reach in your, in your, you know, library of photographers and painters and go, oh, okay. I can treat this the way O'Keefe would. Um, well, I like, I, it's more, um, of like an aha moment or an ooh moment, that electrical, you know, spark when you see something, it's like, ooh, you know, hey, that looks like, you know, O'Keefe. I wish I, I had the other, um, I did a series of these and they're, they're much closer, you know, no, almost no green. If you're all, if you could like zoom in, you'd see nothing but the inside of the flower and the petals are almost like reaching out for you, like, uh. Like in her work, I like I like that being just being surrounded in color, and um, uh, no, I mean I haven't consciously gone out and say, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make some o O'Keefe homages today. No, definitely not. Um, it's just uh, whatever presents itself to me. It's like you know you have a catalog when you're when you're when you're out shooting, you know, because you have you know all these photographers in your head. You know, you kind of see stuff and say, oh, that's that's like so and so. Oh, that's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, most definitely when uh, you guys have those experiences. Yes. I Yeah. Something relative yeah. to that. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, definitely this one, because I, I, I played around with uh, saturating it so that the uh, the colors are nice and mm, crunchy, you know, like a nice. Uh, portobello mushroom you know it's just so full and you know you can almost make a meal out of just the mushroom just like the colors in this if it was like really closer and really saturated you know those colors would just you know sing to you or sing to me anyway um uh but this one i i uh i intentionally popped some flash in there to bring the inside of the flower forward and then i i uh, took some of the black out of the entire image so that it would be paler and uh, it, it gave it a different look, a different feel than saturating it and just, you know, bringing it forward. I, I, I know this isn't a finished print, but it, it, that was that was my thinking when I was shooting it, for sure. You know. Anything? Anything? All right, I'm moving right along. Okay. Huh? What's that? That's it. That's all I had for that. Okay. Now, I mean, I, like just about any, any, you know, I would say trained, but any school, you know, photographer or maybe not, you know, I've always had a, a thing for um, Ansel Adams, you know, depth of field is F64 club. And, uh, you know, like, again, like that catalog when you're out shooting, there's times for bokeh or shallow depth of field. And I could have, I could have definitely um, done that with, with this uh yoga uh yoga master or yoga poser but um i felt like it was important that it was every like to show his environment to make him part of the environment and just i closed the lens all the way down and just you know went for infinity 
you know, uh, everything was in, in sharp focus. And uh, I think it just fit the uh, the feel and the the story of the image by integrating him in the um, in the image by having the uh, deep depth of field and uh, the way Ansel did it. I mean, I wish I <laughs> I had a deer door for some something that could do you know F sixty four and and have it so solid and so tack sharp that it would just you know you could just look at it for for days and days and days and just not see everything you know because there is so much in there there's so much detail that uh when you shoot f64 there's, there's really nothing nothing like it you know, so you know what i like about this the the wall the yoga master and the two uh rocks that are out in the ocean all have the same shape to them you know they all mm. have that 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 zigzag shape is repeated all the way through and the fact that the sun is all the way on the right and it just carves him out of the ocean and it's not just a silhouette but it's a silhouette with dimension that's that's cut into him from that light from the sun and it's a, it's a great capture and I, and um but the one question i'm going to ask you guys in terms of the movement because ken was talking about movements you, you talked about joe george o'keefe is this one related to the previous photo in any way, or is this going to be a separate movement and and and, and some influence that that uh, something influenced you in this one when taking it? Separate movement, separate movement. I mean, I like I like uh, uh, Georgia Keeves' work is primarily in, very in, in your face, very two dimensional, very flat and very you know in your face. The, the colors and you know the subtleties of color. Her gradations in her watercolors are just amazing. You know, and uh, I like the way she blends colors. You know, there's there's a uh, there's just something about someone who's really good with a brush, which is something I, that wasn't me. So uh, uh, that's uh, my homage to that. And I, you know, I do my best to try to capture that on camera. But um, man, I, I, I'm always impressed with uh, you know any illustrator that can really really uh, blend colors the way she does. You know, and watercolor is just uh, it adds a different depth, different dimension, and that uh, bleeding quality. It, it's more alive to me than just a, a, a painting where you can see the brush strokes. You know, I mean, that's great. It works for some people, but I like the texture and the feel of watercolor for me. It, it seems more alive than uh, other mediums of, uh, of uh, illustration. Um, this. And it was like a, you know, another another stack in the library. You know, this, uh, you know, I, I wish you know Ansel Adams had people in his pictures. Sometimes I know I enjoy all the all the levels of grays that he captured, but um, you know, there's just something uh, not not. You know, I still like the you know the human the human condition human <laughs> human condition. You know how how people relate to to uh, subject matter and how they relate to the environment that they're in. And uh, man, when I saw this guy get, I was like, what is he doing? You know, he's going out there. And then I saw him limbering up. And then and then when he started going into his poses, I almost I almost ran to the edge of the edge of the the, um, the stone face behind him where I where my vantage was. And there was a drop off there. I could have fallen in the water, but um, I, I had to get this shot. So I um, I lined it up there, and then I was like, "Those, you know, it would be cool." I mean, he's already the 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 focus of attention. Throwing it in, a, you know, opening it up to a shallow depth of field so that he was the only thing in focus would have changed the image completely. Um, it probably would have been a cool and maybe a cool image, but I, maybe I should have you know done a shallow depth of field on that so that the background was out of focus but uh, like you said i did like the uh repetition of the shapes and how they were almost uh mimicking each other or how he was mimicking them by uh his you know his morphic and their anthropomorphic and then um you know and then that little heart in that rock in the distance i would have totally lost that it's, it's, it's in the shape of that you know heart and uh, I really got a kick out of this image. And so, I mean, through it, it is, I think I got it down to 32. <laughs> and uh, 
I bumped the ISO a little, so it got a little grain in there, but um, I thought F64 and nothing else. If I could, if I could do, if I could have shot this on F64 or, or chased, <laughs> chased him down with a large format camera, you know, I would have, or, or if I had a model who could have done that, but this was, you know, instantaneous, you know, I saw it happening and I made a decision to shoot it with, uh, you know, with the deep depth of field. And uh, that's what I got. I, I really enjoyed this image. Mm -hmm. But I, you I know think... the hardness of the rocks, you know, the hardness of that ledge he's on, and then the softness of the of his pose and the softness of the water and, you know, the hard and soft, the yin and yang was really working for me in this. So. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Ken. Yeah, that's okay. I, I honestly don't see a person there. I see a statue. Uh, wow. Water cool. And... And that, to me, more mimics the rock-like structure that's out in the further distance. And you know, they, they are of the same uh, place and the same time. And they mm -hmm. mirror one another. And to some degree, the space uh, between the legs <laughs> is similar to the hole uh, in the, the rock in the back. And they lead basically into a, the, the same line. Uh, which mm. gives me the relationship to them. Uh, He's almost so, looking right at it. Yeah, and the total, and of course, the to, to me, I mean, you've mentioned Group F64. You've mentioned that you'd like to have a large format camera. You've mentioned that you're, you'd are you like to shoot this at F64. So I'm going with the notion that this was really inspired by something to that degree, even if you don't have the conscious ability to even think that that was the case. Or is this some inclination that says, yeah, this was this was really maybe not totally influenced, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I was thinking about them in some way, shape, or form. Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, it's like when I'm when I'm out shooting, uh, you know, street photography, mm -hmm. you know, like the day we where I ran each other at the Easter parade. Mm -hmm. You know, that catalog is is spinning. You know, there were some where I consciously said, okay, I just want this person because there's. You know, if you've been out there, there's like thousands of people along mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue. And how do you, you know, how do you separate them? So you yep. close, you know, uh, close down your lens um, and you get, you know, or you open up your lens, excuse me, and you get just them in focus. You know, everybody else is out of focus, which is which is a cool effect, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, also through the day, I, I, there were times where I wanted, you know, a deeper depth of field. So, I, you know, I would um close it down and exploit that when when the uh when the, when the situation suited that you know so yeah so that catalog is always you know that those decisions are always running through my head but this one definitely i mean it had the space there isn't always a space like this you know what i mean that yeah. you can exploit a deep depth of field you know a lot of times i mean if you're shooting shooting uh cityscapes or whatever a lot of times you don't have, you know, um, a deep depth of field. You know, yeah. I, what I what, what I used to love shooting in the winter in New York is all the uh, steam rising of, off the buildings. You know, mm -hmm. the steam mm -hmm. stacks, and for seeing that for miles is 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 a really cool thing. But um, you know, it's it's a it's a decision thing. It's a you know something that you keep in your toolbox as a photographer while you're shooting. You know, decide do I do I want F64, do I want that deep, you know, Ansel Adams depth of field, you know, or or do I want, you know, the what I'm shooting or what I'm focusing on as the only thing in focus. Everything before it and behind it should be blurred for me, you know. Yeah. And uh photography is about this choices, California. You know? Uh yes, sir. That's uh San Francisco. Okay. San Francisco, All right, right so, by the so, old uh so uh, here's what we got. We've got a West Coast photographer shooting on the <laughs> West Coast using a uh, large depth of field uh, yeah. with uh, with relationships to the West Coast photographers of Group F64, <laughs> who shot mainly in California. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Right. Well. I mean, it's all there, Greg. Yeah. It's like it's so, like it's, yeah, it's like ninety percent West it, Coast yeah. photographer, man. It's like Weston, you know, Adams, you know, uh, all those guys over there. This is it. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Georgie Keefe is a West Coast. He's, he's yeah. out down there in Arizona or was. <laughs> yes. And it, what's what's interesting is that, of course, the relationship between Jojo Keefe and Alfred, uh, Alfred Stieglitz, you know, and yeah. that yeah. relationship, which is like, OK, they are of a time and a relationship, but yet she's speaking to yeah. a different movement than he is. Right. Yeah, interesting. Right. Right, right, but 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 here's the thing: every each P person that you just mentioned mm -hmm. really deals with the compression of space into that two-dimensional subject quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Dynamics yeah. is definitely compressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg, yeah. yeah. see now That's I know. It. Right, GF sixty-four. You know what? Change it to GF sixty-four. The G standing yeah, for hey. Greg now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Mahalo. <laughs> okay. I have nothing else. Mark, you have anything else for Greg? Nope. That's it. Greg, you have anything else to say? Ah, right. uh, man. Keep shooting, man. I mean, it gets better and better. Just keep looking, keep shooting, keep pushing, you know, try different things and just enjoy the ride, man. Photography is like unending. Yeah. Okay. Only limited by your imagination. That's it. <laughs> All right. So I I will pick up this the mantle now and and speak to uh, well, my influences or cheeseburger. Oh hmm? no, because you know there are so many things that go on within my head and over the years that I can sort of say I've been influenced by mostly almost every movement there is, uh, photographic movement. Uh, because if your mind is always thinking and you're not settling on the current it thing, you are always searching for something different and unique to differentiate you from anything else that might be happening. Now, am I? do I consciously know that that will be the case with whatever I photograph? No, but it's only within my head that I can try to figure that out. So with mm -hmm. that, I'm going to show you this first image that I brought to the plate for today, which is this <laughs> now oh, goodness right <laughs> exactly so uh th it encompasses basically two movements for me one is the straight photography aesthetic which is you, no manipulation it is what it is right you just take components or you create components straight out of camera no manipulation and you just show what's there and you show the world a, a small piece a big piece or what have you. And you then either make it into a realistic form or an abstract form. And so lately I've been really in this abstract thing, not being well defined as to what it is I'm trying to show you. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the time I'm showing you color, I'm showing you gesture, I'm showing you light. And in this particular instance, I was like, wow, I was floored by this when I saw it. And I said, okay, how can I make this work? And boom, you know, and it's a simple yet a complex thing. Right. Color, burst of color. Right. No sense. I mean, you in your brain, you can come up with an idea of Am I, I'm trying to connect it to real life. I'm trying to connect it to real life. And what I'm hoping for is that you can't. And you come into a stumbling block and you say, OK, I got to settle for this. What mm -hmm. it is, what it is. You know, <laughs> well, I, I can tell you what it looks like to me. Uh, well, okay. If you want to settle on that, okay, then I, I will. I will entertain your 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 synopsis. Go ahead. Okay. To me, it looks like garments in a high fashion window uh, during the day with lights on in the shop. Hmm. I thought it was peeling paint at first. Wow. And I thought it was, yeah, because it, it looked like peeling paint, and then it looked like dancers. And then I, I got closer. I was like, oh, okay. Is that the garment district? Not to not to put a, you know, a literal uh, spin on it. But See, no, but that's exactly I what like, you're doing. You're putting a literal spin on it. Yeah, now, and I you're apologize. Changing, and you, you cannot avoid but put a literal spin on it. It's like right. amazingly it's frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> it, looks like, it looks like one of the places that are on like West Broadway or uh, in, somewhere in Tribeca or uh, West Village. I, I like it just the way it is. You know, the the, the light, the, the the tonality of the light 
in in direct sunlight and in shadow, the subtlety of the way it goes from that uh, camel to the deeper colors and then the purple on the end. I just like it the way it is. It's it's amazing what because it's are, nondescript, right? Because I like it's nondescript. the nondescriptness of it, right? Exactly, and and it, it's just amazing that one you can see things like this, and then put it into perspective to share it with someone else mm -hmm. in an abstract form. It's, it's almost defiant. It's like you said. It's like I am what I am. This is what I am. I'm just a couple of colors and a couple of textures. That's me. Right. That's it. <laughs> right, but but it has emotional stamina to it. It creates something within you when you see it. And that is the important part, right? Yeah. That's the part where now you, you, people walk up to color and they say, oh, it's just color, but it's not, actually not that simple. <laughs> mm. Color has emotion. You buy things yeah, because they color, right? Mm. Your favorite color, right? What's your, what? What, car, what color car do you want to buy? Okay, yeah. I want a blue one. Okay, why do you want to buy a blue one? Ah, emotional context, right? right. And, and we, in our daily lives, we tend to forget those things because they're so small within the context of the day, but they mean mm -hmm. so much to us. So when we do- Subconsciously, yeah. Yeah, we definitely do. So- um, It's yeah. making me hungry. That color is reminding me of, of Spanish yeah. rice. Yeah, you're, you're thinking those are just- <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. What? What was that? You think they're gyros, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, Spanish rice. I was thinking Spanish rice. Okay. <laughs> All right. So no, I will move on. Gyros, to, gyros. We say gyros. Now, I'll move on to the next image, which is lately I've been, and I'll give you a hint. I've been looking at a lot of um, uh, color photographers of the 40s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. And uh, I can sort of say that they've influenced my vision on this next particular image, which is this. Okay. Yeah. And, right? So, right. So I've been thinking about them. I've been watching them. And I mean, oh, my goodness gracious, I forgot the photographer's name. I apologize. There are two major photographers um, of the 40s and 50s that have been influencing me so much. I picked up their books and I was like, when I saw this, uh, I was like, wow, yeah, this is really definitive of them. It is of an abstract nature, uh, but it has sensibilities of realism that are within it, but it's still not of a place in a t specific place or a time, but it is mm -hmm. of something. And it is of abstraction because it is, to some degree, flattening a three-dimensional plane into two. So, I'll leave it at that. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. But um, for me, I see I see the depth of the of the two planes that are receding from the from the plane of focus. And for me, uh, they remind me of Ernst Hay Hayes. I think his name Ernst Hayes and. Uh, uh -huh. Haas, uh, -A -A Ernst Haas. Yep, Ernst Haas. Thank you. And um, um, you know, they just remind me of that kind of work from, like you said, from the from the fifties and sixties, where color was sort of something that people really didn't take photographs with seriously. You know. Um, and uh, I, you know, you get a sense of what you know, New York, New York in the winter. You know, it's sort of like that's the that's the real challenge is that you you went to the you went there with your camera and you took photographs in a snowstorm. Like, who would do that? You know. And uh, oh, is that snow? The streaks? They're not on that wall. No, they're not on the wall. Oh, how cool is that? Doc got it. I gotta get better glasses. Hold on. See, I that, see. I think what we need to do is have Mark make his thoughts last. <laughs> <laughs> my my guess is my wild like yeah, right because and and right and one of the photographers was um, Ernst Haas, and and definitely an influence over the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months. I picked up his book. I was looking through that book, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is so cool. 
Yeah. I see it because I think a lot of the, a lot of the cars and signs were that quality of forest green, and you you really and and the and that you know, the forest green and whatever color that wall is and white from the snow that mm-hmm. that's like a like a repetitive uh, color scheme in a lot of those photos, and all of a sudden you'll see like this big splash of a muted red or a very muted yellow, but you've got the yellow there too where the two walls meet. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. You just need you just need that that big muted fire engine red on a round fender, <laughs> and you've got it. <laughs> right, but see, then that would be I, more I, him I, than me. So right, right. <laughs> I, I I I like that you consciously made it a two dimensional, a three dimensional thing into a two dimensional, but then you left that window and that deep depth and that tree in the distance. You know yes. that that really works for me. Yeah, I agree. And, yeah, and what's what the intriguing part about doing these things is you see something from a distance, you know something's happening, and you say, okay, I got to take care of this. I got to do this. I'm seeing something. I'm not consciously knowing what I'm seeing, but I know something's there, right? And so I walk up to the spot and I say, okay, how am I perceiving this? Okay, let me perceive it from the distance in which I originally saw and then let me investigate closer and closer and closer. And then you work it out. And then well, so- I, can say, I can see the work, you know, you know, you know, the casual observers may not see the work, but you know, photographers will look and go, Oh, I see what you're doing there. You're, you're working. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Very good. I, I'm in love with that, that, that forest green. That really does it for me. Yeah. Now there's no color enhancement. There's no saturation adjustment. This color is the color. The only the, the only thing you're seeing is density, which is I've added density, which tends to increase the saturation. Mm. That's a perfectly legitimate dark room technique. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you that. Mm, yeah, because as you see, the forest green is going nearly dark here. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is, of course, when these things are painted over, they're splotchy to be. You know, so that also lends to the nature of it. I'm su- I'm surprised you got to it before they started posting bills on it. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, surprisingly, those guys can't read. You know, that. they don't they, post, they post bills. bills on anything. Yeah, they won't. No, there is really. No. It's amazing. Of all the construction sites that are happening. You, you may see it on 2% of the construction sites, but for the most part, no one posts bills. That's now because they don't have foot traffic that, that would, you know, warrant doing a lot of that. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, anybody got any further questions? Because I'll close it out with this. No, sir. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me stop sharing. And let's say that I enjoyed this that, conversation. That deep green made me made me think of collard greens. I think I'm hungry. <laughs> gonna have some, or some shard, you know. Gonna, sorry. Oh, man. Uh, what I want to say is for the people who are watching, um, I hope we've given you some information to think about. Uh, if you're into photography, uh, engrossed in it thoroughly, or if you just like the idea of photography. We've given you some information just to think about in terms of what does photography look like and what motivates us as photographers, who've motivated us as photographers, why we do it, what we see, and who've influenced us in the ways in which we are. And of course, I think you realize that for the most part, it's not just one individual. Um, it, it's an amalgam of m- multiple individuals, but it could, it could focus itself into one movement. But that would be too specific for some people because then it would restrict you to some way. That's why I think that most photographers move through things uh, than just stay with one particular movement or genre of photography. Unless that's your hook, you know, most people do shoot different things, but, you know, if it's your hook, stick with it. <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah. Okay. With and aromatherapy that. works. Yes, aromatherapy <laughs> is a wonderful thing. With that, so um, we're the three Black Pratt grads, uh, all graduates of the photography, fine art photography program in Pratt Institute, Brooklyn, USA. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation and hope you'll be back for the next one soon. Uh, if you have any questions, any comments, any thoughts about what you've just heard, if you've been here till then, 
please leave a comment. We'd like to hear from you. Thank you very much. Subscribe. And until Ring the bell. We'll catch you next time.